Hello, everybody. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you all here this evening to celebrate Holger Spaman's appointment as the Lawrence R. Grove Professor of Law. Now, I very nearly always follow Holger's advice, and he advised me to keep this short. So I will, though normed, of course, against what deans consider to be short. So I want to start by mentioning that the chair in which Professor Spaman now sits was named after a very public-spirited person. Lawrence Grove served for more than 40 years as clerk of the Massachusetts House of Representatives, and in that capacity built a reputation for bringing a high degree of integrity to a legislative process that badly needed it. There couldn't be a better namesake for Professor Spaman's chair. One of the most distinctive things about Holger as a scholar, as a teacher, and as a colleague is the intellectual and personal integrity he brings to everything he does. As a scholar, Professor Spaman uses sophisticated empirical methods to cast a bright light on important questions. Many involve corporate law, many do not. He has, for example, helped us better understand what factors have contributed to a higher rate of incarceration in the US than in comparable countries. In addition, he and some of his co-authors have done a series of really intriguing experimental studies that tell us a lot about how judges do and do not make decisions and about whether and how much the law matters when they do. And of course, he has written about the Chevron Doctrine. We all do eventually. <laughs> um, Holger is an academic's academic. He's someone who's playful about ideas, who takes risks, who digs deep into human behavior, and who sees disagreement as an opportunity for learning. His work is simultaneously bold and measured. It tells us not only what we can learn from facts in the world, but also what we can't. And that's where his integrity comes through most strongly. It's also why Holger's work shapes our understanding not only of important topics, but also, and this is a big contribution in its own right, about how excellent empirical work is done. Okay, again, I said I'd be brief, and Holger will definitely let me know if I haven't been. So I have just two more quick things to say. Holger Spaman is also a creative and hardworking teacher. He's developed wonderful online lectures, exercises, a flipped classroom, and modular teaching that lets students dip into a course to focus on what they most want and need to learn. He also has a great case book on corporations that emphasizes newer cases, more recently in the news, that students might actually want to learn about. Imagine that. <laughs> um, Professor Spaman is a true innovator. It's hard work, and he invests a lot in it, and with great results. Finally, my last point, Professor Spaman is an amazing colleague. We've now served together for two years on the Appointments Committee. He's a great reader. He's wise. He's tough. He gets along with, respects, and is respected by both people who think about the world the same way he does and people who think about it very differently. Professor Spaman also makes everyone around him better. OK, final, final point. Holger's an awesome human. He somehow manages to be direct and blunt and kind and affirming all at once. He also has a good, mostly mischievous, sense of humor. And that makes it especially fun to be his colleague and friend. OK, Holger, this may not have seemed brief to you, but you don't know what the baseline was. <laughs> And so without further delay, I give you the Lawrence R. Grove Professor of Law, Holger Spahn. That's sort of what I feared. Uh, <laughs> thank you for being here. Uh, I'm um, a little embarrassed by all the attention. And in fact, I didn't want to give a lecture for that reason. But then I was told that I wouldn't get my chair. Um, 
if I didn't give the lecture and I do want my chair. <laughs> While I was dragging my feet, uh, it seems like somebody else took my first choice chair. So now I believe I will get my second choice. Uh, looking at it there, it seems a bit smaller than I imagined it to be in real life, but uh, you know, I still, I still want it. Um, now, as many of you know, and as John said, um, I work a lot on technical topics in corporate law, uh, using mathematical models and statistics. Um, but I also work on an evergreen of legal discourse that is um, as popular, actually as popular as originalism, and more popular than Chevron, even, in law review uh, citations. And that is the common civil law distinction. Now, I personally don't think that the common civil law distinction should be such a big topic in legal scholarship. In fact, I was drawn to the topic because what I experienced um, as a lawyer first trained in France and Germany, then coming to the US, practicing uh, in New York for a while and then Europe for a while, didn't match up with the uh, myths that were being propounded about the common law and the civil law, um, the, the common, common law and the civil law. Um, in any event, so from my own, own experience, um, I don't uh, give much credence to these uh, myths, but then I also think methodologically that uh, I don't trust my own judgment, and you shouldn't trust my own judgment either, and that's going to be a big uh, theme of this talk. Now, to begin, uh, what are we talking about? What are common in civil law? Um, I will problemize these concepts later. Um, but for now, let me give you a working definition that I personally think is also the best definition. Common and civil law mean legal systems um, of or mainly influenced by England or continental Europe, respectively. Between 1100 and 1900 AD, continental European legal institutions were gradually infiltrated by university graduates trained in Roman law. They didn't make the local law Roman but they at least brought a vocabulary and ideas, and they entertained a pan-European legal discourse with a center of gravity that moved over time from Italy to France and the Netherlands and then to Germany. England was never completely isolated uh, from this, as later English nationalists claimed. But England had centralized its courts very early, um, starting in the late 11th century. And these centralized courts developed their own terminology and their own rights that being centralized and hence strong were more resistant to Roman law. Partly thanks to its relatively high degree of centralization, England also didn't feel the need to codify in the 19th century as most Euro uh, continental European countries did. This parochial European story became a global story in colonial times. The European countries exported their law through force and prestige. As a result, one can today uh, group almost all the world's legal systems into common and civil law systems, as shown on this map. Civil law is blue, common law is red, orange or yellow, and mixed is purple. These are often called legal families. Now, please don't think that all the blue countries have the same law or all the red countries have the same law. Um, the colonies' legal systems generally did not become carbon copies of the colonizers, far from it. But they often did adopt um, the colonizers' language as a legal language, especially in the English colonies. And they still refer to English legal authorities. For example, you may see the English case Hadley v. Baxendale um, cited as authority in common law courts around the world. Perhaps most importantly, the recipient countries absorb the legal uh, vocabulary or concepts, if you will, such as consideration. Judges from most common law countries around the world even still wear wigs. So the next time you find yourself abducted, blindfolded, and flown to some unknown location, if you manage to escape and you stumble into some courthouse and you see people wear wigs and speak English, you know that they will understand if you tell them that you have been the victim of the torts of battery and false imprisonment. In fact, even if you don't manage to escape, but you somehow manage to rip the blindfold off and you see somebody walk by in a wig, you know that they will understand when you shout out to them, habeas corpus. Now, they may not do anything because you didn't, file your your, you, you didn't file your request in writing. We'll get back to that. But at least they'll understand uh, what you're talking about. 
By contrast, if a civil law judge were to walk by and you shout habeas corpus, no entiendo. Okay, now uh, seriously, uh, the similarities within each legal family actually have practical payoff. They facilitate intrafamily communications and the intrafamily exchange of ideas and personnel. The legal families are like language families, such as Romance or Germanic languages. Individual languages within each family are definitely not the same, um, and nor are language families hermetically sealed. But a family's common historical roots manifest in similarity of vocabulary and grammar that make it much easier to move within a language family than across. In earlier work, I looked at this systematically. Um, within Europe and North America, it's all a bit of a mess. The US and to a lesser extent the UK um, are hegemons, at least when it comes to business law. Um, and everybody looks, for them, looks to them for ideas. But when you look elsewhere around the world, you see an amazing transmission of models and knowledge that is largely confined within legal family boundaries. France, the UK, and to a lesser extent, the Netherlands, Germany, and some other countries have legal development offices that exclusively cater to countries within their legal uh, families. The influence is sometimes astonishing. There's an amazing amount of literal copying of statutes to the point of copying typos and section numberings uh, from the donor country. You also see continued influence of legal writing um, and exchange of personnel heavily concentrated within uh, legal families. The US muddies the water a little because as the global hegemon and the top dog in the Americas, um, the US exerts influence everywhere, especially in Latin America. Still, even in Latin America today, there's a lot of influence um, of the continental legal scholarship and statutory models, and this is because they look within their civil law family for inspiration. So far, so good. Uh, I think this is interesting and, again, helpful to orient yourself in the global world of law. But it only gets you so far. To use the language analogy again, you wouldn't say that India and the United States have the same culture just because both countries have English as their main or one of the main languages. And you definitely shouldn't assume that they have the same law. They don't. To be sure, there are few rules um, that may be predict predictably different between uh, common law and civil law countries. But I can't get very excited about these because, well, um, you'll see. Apparently, you can make a valid will in front of a notary in every civil law country, but in no common law country. That sort of stuff. Okay. Uh, somewhat more meaningful, the trust does not technically and fully exist in civil law countries, um, but, but there are workarounds. Another widespread difference is that um, common law countries generally don't grant specific performance as of right and don't allow penalty clauses while civil law countries do. Now, both common and civil law countries have deviations from this ba baseline. Um, so in actuality, they may be close together. But I'd like to mention this one because it cuts against the very well-known uh, myth that the common law is more respectful of contractual freedom than the civil law. Now, specific performance clauses and penalty clauses are contract clauses, and the common law traditionally has not allowed them, whereas the civil law has, at least as a first, as a first approximation. But still, this is all pretty boring, uh, I find, uh, and it wouldn't make the common civil law distinction um, compete with originalism in a law review uh, mentions, uh, so what does? Um, it's precedent or the lack thereof. This is the big myth about common and civil law that gets people excited. The civil law doesn't have precedent or so people um, still say. Now, expert comparators, I should say right away, um, haven't believed this for a long time. Nonetheless, still today, half the published articles that mention precedent in connection with civil law assert that the civil law doesn't have it. Um, and in truth, it's more complicated. But let's um, start with the basics. Those of you who know me probably uh, expect some statistics uh, and graphs at this point. I'll get there. Um, but for now, I just want to do a bit of show and tell. Because if something is blatantly obvious, you don't need complicated numbers to make the point. Now, this is the Grüneberg, a commentary on the German civil code. Every German lawyer, or at least every uh, lawyer working in private law, has this book on their desk or on the shelf behind them. 
I put up a picture of someone holding the Grüneberg just to give you a, a sense of its size. It has 3,000 pages and weighs a hefty five pounds. What's in it? Mostly precedents, uh, organized around themes indexed by the code. There are lots of precedents, so the print has to be very small. But if you can read anything, most of any numbers you see refer to some case reporter. The statutory text of the code is also reproduced in the Grüneberg, but that's a tiny fraction of the overall text in the book. At this point, the code is really just an indexing system to help the expert find the relevant precedents. By the way, the authors are judges. Precedent is just what they, what they do. Now, you might think perhaps this is a, a German thing or, or a modern thing. Um, perhaps it wasn't like this in the 19th century, or perhaps it isn't like this in France. You might have heard or read um, someone say that the French Civil Code, specifically its Article 5, um, prohibits judicial precedent. Well, um, here is Article 5, annotated with precedence, <laughs> jurisprudence. In the standard French edition of the Civil Code, the Siri, here one of its earliest editions from 1817. The first edition appeared in 1814, just 10 years after the promulgation of the Civil Code. Siri, by the way, was a practitioner, and his was a work for all practitioners. They clearly cared about precedent from the get-go. You sometimes read that 19th century France had the so-called Ecole de l'Exegèse, uh, which was an academic movement that rejected anything but a close reading of the text of the code. But whatever they were doing in the ivory tower, uh, the practice didn't care. The practice was busy developing the um, case law. Now, it is true that civil law countries generally did not develop a model, uh, a, a rule of stare decisis. That is a formal rule that prior decisions constitute the law and must be respected as such. But until the 19th century, um, the common law didn't have stare decisis either. Stare decisis is a 19th century invention. In any event, as a legal realist, I can't get very excited about stare decisis. Uh, even with stare decisis, um, courts can overrule or distinguish old cases or just ignore them. Even without stare decisis, courts can um, respect prior decisions as they had in the common law before the 19th century. Uh, and just based on experience, I wouldn't be able to say whether German or, uh, or US courts, for example, are more respectful of precedent. Um, John Dawson, in his famous book on the oracles of the law, concluded that they are about the same. But one of my pet peeves and a major point I want to um, get across in this talk is that personal experience isn't particularly helpful when we're dealing with something that is ostensibly a global phenomenon in the legal world. Uh, modern legal systems are so complex that one can hardly be an expert in one, uh, less so two, and clearly not in more than two or three. Heck, I'm not even sure that I'm an expert of uh, US corporate law. I'm sorry for my students in the room, but uh, you know, I, um, what, you know, whatever you learn is uh, it's good enough for the exam, all right? So, um, <laughs> um, so you know, I have some sense how precedent operates in Delaware corporate law or federal securities law, uh, and I know that precedent is a joke in U.S. constitutional law, but I don't know how it operates elsewhere in U.S. law uh, or, or in, let alone in like all common law systems, and the same, of course, with German and civil law um, systems. Okay. Now, so how does one then approach such a question? Um, well, of course, by collecting data. Um, one thing I've done is an experiment with uh, real judges. John mentioned it, actually, from seven jurisdictions, two common law and five civil law. In each jurisdiction, we gave the judges the same international criminal law case, um, but we randomly varied the precedent that we made available uh, and briefed. Judges from the common law countries, US and India, didn't decide more in line with precedents than the judges from the uh, civil law countries, France, Germany, China, Argentina, and Brazil. If anything, it was the opposite. Perhaps you're thinking that an international criminal law case wasn't a good test. What if we gave the judges a domestic case, maybe a civil case? Well, we did that uh, with US judges. We found the same. We could barely get US judges to follow the law as expressed in precedent and uh, other sources. 
I don't have time to go into details, and I don't want to leave you with the impression that uh, US judges don't decide with some predictability uh, and consistency in the real world. They do, but that's because they usually decide matters that are sort of standard. Our experiment involved them deciding a case that was, for them, novel. There, they reach to precedent in just the same way that judges do when they get a novel case. Uh, in that situation, we found that the precedent barely made a difference in their decisions. They mentioned the law and the precedent and their reasons, but it had no effect on the outcome. Um, so to summarize what we have so far, France and Germany are clearly full uh, of precedent, and it's unclear that their precedents are any uh, less strong than, say, uh, US precedents. In this sense, the, absident, the absence of precedent in the civil law is a myth. This is what the comparatists have known for uh, a long time. There, ha there are, however, two complications. One is country coverage. For example, apparently Brazil does not have case law. Italy, on the other hand, seems to have too much case law in the sense that their Corte di Cassazione churns out about 100,000 decisions uh, each year that are often inconsistent with one another. Brazil and Italy are both uh, civil law countries by my working definition. So then which is the real civil law? France and Germany or Brazil and Italy? Um, I'll get back to that later. The other complication is not the if, but the how. Uh, and more generally, the how of legal reasoning. When you look at judicial opinions uh, around the world, you see distinct differences. These differences are interesting from two perspectives. First, they may tell you something about how their authors, that is the judges, um, reasoned. Now, that's tricky because the judge doesn't necessarily write down what they were thinking as they were making uh, up the decision. I'll get back to that. Second, however, um, what's in the written opinion is clearly relevant for subsequent work by lawyers, including judges, uh, as they are working with the published opinion. So for example, in the US, we're used to having an opinion of the court. And that is arguably the embodiment, the primary embodiment of the president. In England, there is no opinion of the court. Each judge gives their speech, and then it's up to subsequent uh, lawyers to figure out which of these speeches, how, they are made, how to make them consistent with one another, and figure out what the content of that uh, precedent is. Clearly, there's that difference then in the U between the US and the UK and how you work with uh, precedent. But let's get back to common law and civil law, uh, more specifically, England and, and, and Germany. When you open any case reporters from these two countries, you immediately notice a difference in style. The Germans speak, no, they, they, don't, they don't speak, they write in the third person uh, and in a very technocratic, impersonal manner. Um, German opinions are opinions of the court and dissents are generally not registered. The English judges, by contrast, write personal speeches uh, in the first person and generally in a more um, colloquial style. But what I want to focus on is the reasoning uh, in the opinion. My impression, just from reading opinions over the years, had been that um, the reasoning is really pretty much the same. Once you strip away superficialities, such as the tone and the style of citations. Um, but I didn't trust my impressionistic uh, judgment. And I also wanted to know if the equivalence that I perceived was only the result of 20th century um, convergence. So uh, I said about studying this systematically. With some co-authors, we took the 10 most cited and 10 randomly chosen contract law cases from the 1880s and the 2010s uh, in England and Germany, respectively, and coded the reasoning. Um, here's a first cut of this. Starting clockwise from the top left, the four plots show the number of words per decision and the number of citations to cases literature and statutes, respectively. Within each plot, the 1880s are on the left and the 2010s on the right. Uh, and within every decade, English cases are the blue bars on the left and German cases, the orange bars on the right. The bars indicate the number of citations, etc. Within each plot, country and decade, we have ordered the cases um, by the number of citations and so on from lowest to highest to give you a sense of the distribution and drawn a horizontal line to indicate the mean. 
The top left plot shows you that the English decisions have been and still are much longer and both have grown much longer over time. Next on the top right, you see that English decisions contain more citations to cases, although the Germans have almost caught up and adjusted for decision length, they now have more citations to cases. In the bottom left, you see that English and German cases judges cite statutes with equal frequency, which should put to rest the myth that common law systems don't use statutes uh, as much, if anybody still believes that. Um, finally, the German decisions make much more use of literature, um, but much of that literature are compendia of precedents like the Grüneberg you saw earlier. And this is all still pretty crude. Um, when we go deeper, oops, what happened now? Did I just discuss the wrong figure? Did you see this one before? You saw this one before. Now you see this one. All right, good, all right. You did, now, did you see this one before or not? Yes. Well, have a brief look before I go on. <laughs> Somebody should have spoken up, okay? I don't, <laughs> all right. Words, case citations, statute citations, literature citations, here we go, all right. Now, you've already looked at this one, so I can be really quick here. Um, <laughs> case citations about the same, very interesting, overruling, the English and the Germans both do it. That I think is interesting because the Germans explicitly overrule. Like if you thought that the Germans didn't have like a real notion of precedent, why would they explicitly overrule their precedents? They do. And they do it about as frequently as the English. Even more interesting, they distinguish cases. There is a myth about the way that civil lawyers, uh, that, that there's this myth that only the common lawyers have this technique of distinguishing precedents. Well, here we see the German judges don't do it as often as the English judges, but they do it, um, they, they, they also do it, and they already did it in the 1880s. <coughs> um, where you see a difference, though, is uh, in the le level of engagement of the precedents. So um, when you look at the bottom row, the right and middle panel, you see that the English judges and their decisions and in their opinions, they um, talk much more about the facts and the reasons of the um, prior decisions. Now, you might think that this um, confirms another myth about common law and civil lawyers, which is that the common lawyers are more attentive uh, to the facts and reason from the facts more than uh, civil lawyers. A related myth is that the common law is more open to doing justice in an individual case. Um, that is, it is more flexible than the civil law. There are two substantive reasons why you might be skeptical of such claims from the get-go. Uh, one is English legal history. Historically, um, the common law was notoriously inflexible um, with its attachment to forms of action um, and other formalisms. Equity arose to soften this uh, until equity itself ossified into something like the common law. The other substantive reason for skepticism is uh, if you're familiar with the comparative law literature. There you also find the opposite cliche, um, that the common law is quaintly attached to certain formalisms. That is, it is inflexible. Indeed, I found both cliches in one famous article on the subject of civil versus common law. The author lauds the common law's uh, flexibility on one page, and then three pages later marvels at the English law's attachment to certain formalisms that prevent it from doing justice in particular cases. Um, the reason why this can, can happen, why the same author can support two incompatible uh, myths uh, within the span of a few pages is a deficiency of method, and that's what I mostly want to um, talk about. The usual method, how people write about common and civil law, is to take one or two instances from um, uh, one member of each legal family, and then to claim that these are representative. And that's where things go very wrong, because legal systems are very multifaceted, uh, and different systems within the same legal family aren't necessarily alike at all. Every legal system has some instances when the system is flexible, some when it is not. Some when, it's, when it closely scrutinizes the facts and some when it does not. Some when it bends a rule to achieve justice and some when it does not. So you can always find an instance of just about anything in any legal system and definitely in each legal family. And that's why you can contradict yourself in the span of three pages if you're not careful. <laughs> 
Uh, let me illustrate that with an anecdote. Uh, there's an intended pun here that will become clear in uh, 30 seconds. When I had just started as a graduate student working on a topic related to common and uh, civil law, the author that I just mentioned um, gave a guest lecture at Harvard Law School. Some of you might have been here. Um, he was and is the most ardent defender uh, of the common civil law divide. Um, so I was very excited to hear what he had to say. Uh, it was somewhat of a letdown um, when his talk consisted mostly of him asserting his right to anecdote, um, which I guess is quote for asserting a right not to bring any evidence. Um, I don't think there is such a right in serious conversations, uh, let alone academic debates. Uh, anyway, he proceeded to tell the story of how he was a visiting professor in uh, Paris at the Sorbonne, where I, my alma mater, uh, and how he uh, went to the library and uh, he didn't have his university ID with him, so the guard didn't let him in. And he uh, told the story, I guess, to show how inflexible these uh, civil lawyers are. In this case, the guard <laughs> didn't let him in. Um, this is really silly, and so I hesitate even to tell you um, what the young fiery me uh, retorted. Um, well, I told my own anecdote, which was about me enrolling at that very same university uh, without the proper healthcare documentation. Um, the French administrator enrolled me anyway. Uh, good luck trying that here. Um, so unsurprisingly, uh, we fought this anecdote battle to a draw. Um, now, when you do this with judicial decisions rather than with uh, real-life stories, it's still anecdotes, uh, and it's still just as unsuitable. For illustration, let me play this silly game one more time with a judicial decision. I started off with the myth that the common law is big on facts and flexibility, whereas the civil law cares about abstract rules even at the expense of justice uh, in the case. So let me give you an example that is starkly inconsistent with this. So now I can test whether you've been paying attention. Am I showing you here a common lawyer or a civil lawyer? Common lawyer, yes, because this gentleman is wearing a wig. Um, um, this is Lord Halsbury, uh, a famous English judge. He was on the House of Lords when it decided Salomon v. Salomon, uh, probably the most famous case in English company law. Now, the case dealt with limited liability in corporate law. The question in the case was whether a shareholder had limited liability for contractual debts of the company. In time, let me just tell you about uh, Salomon v. Salomon. So, as I said, limited liability, shareholder, contractual debt. Um, and, uh, well, Lord, uh, Lord Halsbury, you know, the question was, at the time, English company law required seven shareholders for a valid company formation, and Salomon uh, was uh, the only real shareholder, and then there were six figureheads who had one share each, but no involvement in the company. And the question was, did that count as a real company, so that Salomon would have, the, the man, would have limited uh, liability? And uh, Lord Halsbury had a very simple answer. I'm quoting, the sole guide must be the statute itself, end quote. Um, and the statute said that you needed seven shareholders, and it didn't say anything about them having to be real shareholders or anything like that, so limited liability obtained. Now, 100 years later, um, the House of Lords again confronted the question of limited liability, but this time limited liability for tort claims, specifically of asbestos victims. Now, that's a materially different question uh, in many ways, one of them being that tort creditors generally don't get to choose their debtor. Nonetheless, Lord Slate and Adams v. Cape held that, again, quote, that would be on the slide now if you could see it, um, the court is not free to disregard the principle of Solomon v. Solomon merely because it considers that justice so requires, end quote. Notice that neither opinion um, dived deep into the facts to reach its decision, and the latter opinion um, did not hold the earlier decision to its facts. Um, instead, the first opinion just appealed to the simple rule in the statute, uh, and the second opinion just appealed to the principle uh, in the first opinion, notwithstanding the fact that the first decision concerned a materially different, different question. Um, both are completely inconsistent with the um, 
myth of the flexible, fact-focused, justice-oriented uh, common law. And I didn't even need to look very far. This is, as I said, the, probably the most famous decision in uh, English, English company law. Now, obviously, um, I could also do the inverse and find an English case that is uh, very much focused on the facts and doing justice in the case. And I could play the same game in some civil law um, jurisdiction. But I'll spare you that because it's obviously silly and I hope that that's um, clear by now. In fact, this game is even sillier um, than what I have said so far because the game is played with published or at least written judicial opinions. And how much do these written opinions tell us about how judges really reasoned? Possibly very little. The published opinion, not a good idea for doing uh, research on how judges actually reason or ultimately how the, the law functions. Uh, and uh, there's no better way of uh, making this point than by looking at a French decision. Um, this is the uh, famous Jean Dor opinion of the French Cour de Cassation, sitting en banc in 1930. Um, oops. This is the decision that ushered in strict liability for vehicle accidents in, the, uh, in French law, so it was pretty important. Um, by the way, flashback here to the question of uh, case law and the civil law. Uh, this is an example of major judge-made law in French law, and they all knew it uh, when the decision came down. That's why they were sitting uh, on, on bank. Um, and well, anyway, that's just normal procedure in France. Um, but here what I want to focus on is the opinion. Uh, what you see on the screen is all there is. This is the entire opinion. One sentence. Three paragraphs, I haven't edited a single bit. The ellipsis there is not mine. That's already in the decision, it's about the name. Um, I didn't bother to translate it into English because you wouldn't be able to make any sense of it anyway. Um, it's uh, so dense and coded. This is the typical cryptic style of French decisions until uh, 2019 when they had a reform of the um, form of their opinion. Um, now here it is, I think, absolutely clear that the judges that decided this case were thinking about much more than they wrote. Um, and that's not a secret. Each case in France generally has a report by a reporter, judges, a judge, that is published. And there's an entire genre of legal literature called the case commentary that uh, situates the case in the other precedents and uh, the debates around around this question, often written by somebody who has inside knowledge about what the judges were thinking. So it's no surprise that when Mitch Lasser embedded himself in the French Cour de Cassation in the 1990s, he found the French judges to be every bit as pragmatic or not pragmatic or whatever as uh, the US judges, US justices on the US Supreme Court. Um, the takeaway for our purposes is that one absolutely cannot use the published French opinions to infer how French judges reason. Um, that the French opinions are so extreme makes it obvious. But of course, it isn't really different anywhere else. Just because the published opinions are longer elsewhere doesn't mean that they are more truthful, so to speak, in terms of revealing what the judges were actually thinking. It's always a um, performance. It's interesting to think about the performance as a performance? Who's the audience that they're playing to and why do these audiences apparently expect different things in different places? Um, you know, my personal sense is that a lot of it is probably just happenstance and doesn't have a deeper meaning. Um, but anyway, that's an interesting question. I unfortunately don't have any time to pursue this in this talk. Let me recapitulate. Um, there are two reasons why looking at individual published dis, um, opinions, the usual fare of common civil law comparison, is not the right approach to ascertain abstract qualities of um, legal systems, let alone legal families, such as whether common or civil law are more flexible. Um, first, individual cases aren't necessarily representative of the totality of cases. Second, published opinions um, are necessarily representative of the actual reasoning behind the case. There are many ways how one could uh, study uh, various abstract qualities systematically, and virtually none of it has been done. Uh, I took a small first step to study judicial uh, reasoning systematically uh, in my seven country experiment. There we tracked our judge participants uh, while they were working on the case. 
we gave them the materials on a computer and the computer recorded every 10 seconds which document, in fact, each paragraph, but uh, each document that they were looking at at that, at that moment. Um, so that's what I have on this slide. Uh, each panel is one country. Starting at the top from left to right, we have Argentina, Brazil, China, France, and Germany. Uh, and uh, these are all civil law countries. And the bottom row, we have um, you know, India and the United States. These are our common law countries. Within each panel, that is within each country, individual judges are stacked vertically. So each horizontal line in the panel is one judge. Can I show you this here? So here, Argentina, that's one judge. That's judge number two, and so on. Um, they are going through the case from left to right, start to finish. We have uh, scaled the time here, rescaled the time so that they all take the same, they, they're normalized to have the same, the same length. And then the, the color coding indicates which document they were looking at at that relative moment of time. Um, the gray is the facts, black is the briefs, yellow is the trial judgment, green is the statute, uh, and blue is the precedent. At first glance, all seven countries look pretty similar. Um, judges everywhere tend to start with the facts, then move on to the briefs, and then the trial judgment, and then occasionally check out the statute or the precedent. So at the highest level, the takeaway here should be that um, the judges everywhere behave the same. I want to emphasize that because abstractly, you might have thought that in some jurisdiction, they start with the statute or elsewhere they start with the precedent. Maybe somewhere they start with the briefs. But that's not what we see. Virtually everywhere they start with facts and the briefs and so on. There is variation, but that variation is mostly within countries, not from one country um, to the next. Now, that said, machines, um, um, I, 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 sorry. Yeah. That said, machines can do this better. They actually can detect differences here, even though we, with our naked eye, we wouldn't be able to tell, you know, is there some random variation or something else going on? Uh, and, and we've done that. I'll spare you the details of how we did it, but the bottom line is that we can distinguish countries. So the, 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 the countries are different from each other, but the families are not different from another. So you, you, can, you can tell apart the countries, but you can't tell apart the families. That matches. Um, my um, personal experience um, that I perceive differences between countries, but it doesn't match up with the, um, the, the system um, divide. I tell you that just in case you trust a human more than a machine, but you shouldn't. You should trust the machine uh, <laughs> more than the human, at least on this particular point. So I should say a word about that, um, because humans are incredibly good at certain things without understanding how they do it. So like throwing a ball or judging the emotions on somebody's face, humans are extremely good at. But there's a reason why they are good at that, and that reason doesn't carry over to comparative law. The reason is that when you, when you throw a ball, you immediately see where it goes, and you can throw the ball again. And that's what children do, right? You throw the ball, you throw the ball, and eventually you become amazingly good. When you think about the physics, amazingly good, judging faces. We're extremely good at judging faces. I mean, we can be, make mistakes, but overall, we're very, very good at uh, judging faces because from childhood onwards, we see people and then we see what they do. Do they start to cry? Do they shout? Do they, you know, whatever it is. Do they, we, we, so we, we can tell. We can learn, we learn how to read emotions. Frequent fr very frequent instant feedback. Now, system comparison is nothing like that. You don't get to assess whether a particular legal system is, let's say, flexible, and then the light goes on and tells you, oh, you were right, or you were wrong, or whatever it is. No, you just do it once, and then you know, never, there's never any feedback on how you, uh, on how you did. Um, it's a completely different task from the kind of thing where humans are uh, intuitively good at. In fact, we know from psychology and research on expert decision making that humans are terrible at intuitive uh, learning when those conditions of uh, instant and frequent feedback do not hold. Humans don't go out and test their hypotheses in order to actually learn about them. They do the opposite. They ignore countervailing evidence and just handpick the evidence that supports their initially formed um, hypothesis. And I think, I suspect um, that's what happened in the most cited and taught book on civil and common law in the United States, John Merriman's Civil Law Tradition. 
in the preface, Merriman frankly admits that um, his account of the civil law doesn't fit France and Germany. He says that they are atypical and that the real civil law is what we have in the Mediterranean and in Latin America. Now, that's a really odd choice because, as I said in the beginning, uh, France and Germany have been the core countries of the civil law from about the 16th century onwards. That's not just me saying this. Merriman himself mostly discusses French and German uh, um, um, examples in, in, in the book. Um, to be sure, Merriman believes in a civil law tradition, which he defines as a set of deeply rooted, historically conditioned attitudes about the way law is or should be made, applied, studied, perfected, and taught, end quote. Now, a priori, I would have thought that historical roots would be deepest in the origin countries and not, let's say, in Latin America, where this was clearly uh, an import. But OK, perhaps France and Germany somehow killed their roots and uh, the tradition only lives on uh, elsewhere. Um, still, one has to wonder what exactly um, that tradition is supposed to be. Merriman locates the origin of the civil law in 450 BC, uh, Rome, ancient Rome. Um, back then, Roman law was casuistic, no code. Um, if it resembled modern law at all, it resembled the modern cliche of the common law. Um, this had completely changed by the time, by, by Byzantine times, when Justinian um, compiled existing sources into his unsystematic corpus juris. Justinian prohibited further commentary. But that's the first thing that the medieval Europeans did when they rediscovered the, the codex, uh, the corpus. So the, the very act of rediscovery was going against this whole spirit of the corpus as Justinian had um, conceived it. Um, 19th century codification in Europe was another thing uh, altogether again uh, because it was um, systematic. It had like these big overarching concepts that the uh, Justinian um, corpus did not have. Um, politically, civil law has been associated with everything from feudalism to fascism, social democracy, laissez-faire. Um, so I have real difficulty seeing uh, a tradition here, if tradition is supposed to be anything substantive. Um, of course, I can see the continuity of certain terminology um, and, and even publication forms. Alan Watson has written about that, and um, it is a fascinating phenomenon, but it's a surface phenomenon and doesn't support the kind of tradition that Merriman imagines. Merriman makes similarly odd choices among the common law countries. In his writing, Merriman implicitly or explicitly takes the United States as the representative of the common law, even though he also acknowledges that the common law, that the United States actually is not like the traditional common law. Um, now, there's one aspect of tradition that I wanted to revisit, uh, and that's precedent in the civil law. Earlier in my talk, I acknowledged that there are some countries, um, specifically Brazil, that are traditionally classified as civil law countries, but that do not appear to have case law. And since there are some Brazilians in the room, I just want to say, I'm not judging, but that's what all the Brazilians, including maybe one that's in the room, have tried to tell me over the years, OK? So I just take that from you. Um, they do not appear to have case law. And I ask what we are to make of this um, when we have France and Germany have case law, Brazil does not, and Italy is somewhat weird. Like, which is the real deal now? Which is the, what, what is the civil law? Um, well, ultimately, of course, it depends on how you define civil law. Um, but if by civil law you mean a historical tradition um, that existed in Europe before being exported around the world, um, then it's now clear that case law is an important part of it. The historical record is very clear that um, cities in uh, German, French, Italian cities uh, in the uh, early modern period were full of case law. Um, so, um, if Brazil today doesn't have case law, super interesting, but can't we really say that's because there are a civil law, uh, a civil law country? <laughs>
All right, I hope it's clear from my discussion of um, Brazil uh, and other countries that I absolutely do not think that all legal systems are the same. Um, not even the neighboring countries with similar economic um, um, development. In other words, I'm not saying that there are overall less differences than the common civil law myths suggest. But I think the real differences are different differences, and they mostly don't follow the common civil law division and what people associate with it. Um, one difference between um, common and civil law that could have a profound impact but hasn't been explored at all is how judges are appointed. By and large, common law jurisdictions um, appoint practitioners after a successful career, usually in private practice, while civil law jurisdictions appoint graduates straight out of university. Um, this can have all sorts of implications. One that hasn't received any attention is the worldview that these judges bring to their job. If you are appointed an English judge after a successful career as a barrister, you have been an employer for many years, you probably own a house, and you've probably uh, advised businesses. And by contrast, if you are appointed a French judge straight out of university, then you will probably be a consumer, tenant, and employee for your entire life, and I can't help thinking that that probably has an impact on how you relate to consumer law, landlord, tenant law, and employment law um, disputes. Um, I'm also fascinated by the higher order question. Uh, what effects the myths have on internal legal discourse? If I'm no different from you, but I think in some fundamental sense, but I think I'm different from you, then somehow this is going to change how I reason about myself and perhaps then end up ultimately end up doing things differently than I otherwise uh, would have. At the very least, it affects rhetoric. Um, if it weren't for the civil law myth, it just wouldn't make any sense for a Brazilian lawyer to say that they don't have precedent because they are a civil law country. So at least um, there is that. But even to perceive this as an interesting question, uh, we first have to see the myths as what they are, which is myths. Um, speaking of myths one last time, I slipped one by you and I wonder how many noticed. Um, this is of course Charles sitting on the sovereign's throne and if you google Charles coronation the picture will pop up a lot. But actually Charles coronation hasn't happened yet. Um, the picture is from May of this year when Charles was still prince and very much was not yet crowned. Um, he was merely standing in for his mother, the queen, in opening for parliament uh, this year. Um, now, why this picture pops up when you Google Charles' coronation may have several answers. Perhaps one reason is that the New York Times featured it in an article on Charles' accession to the throne. But I suspect another answer is that people just imagine that there must be a fancy throne and the actual throne that Charles sat on during the accession ceremony looks more like a pompous living room chair. Uh, and I think many common law civil law myths arise in much the same way. Anyway, now I hope I can get my chair. Right. <laughs> I'm, still, I'm really waiting, though. I, <laughs> so this will be half off track because it's only on the common law side. If we take the subset of, say, courses at Harvard Law School that some of us teach and others of us take that use the case method and say are not like constitutional law or antitrust where a lot of the cases might be, say, the most recent controlling precedent on X, but rather more like, say, contracts or torts we have a little from here, a little from there. This state, that state, this doctrine, that doctrine, crossing a century or more, a few old English cases and whatever. Of course, those cases were selected to be in the casebook as representative of something to tell various stories. Um, aside from an interesting literary interpretation exercise, 
what should we make of whether there's any content relevant to anything that we should infer from the fact that these cases are in this book and this is what we teach? I look at them as a training material. I mean, they are sometimes they're selected not because they are the law, but because they made some stupid mistake or I don't know something, right? Um, so they're not actually being taught as the law, and it's still useful. Like there are facts there, you can talk about the facts, and you can like play around with some uh, um, alternate theories. So yeah, I, I I think that they're being taught just as training materials, and you could do something else at least in in, in, in principle. Any other questions that people really want? So, um, at least in, in the proof and sort of evidence world, the usual common civil law divide is between adversarial versus inquisitorial. Is your thesis about the myth of the difference between the two the same? Oh, yeah, that's a complete red herring as well. That's a complete red herring. I mean, you know, the inquisitorial is a bad name anyway, because of course it evokes memories of, uh, you know, the Spanish Inquisition riding around and torturing people. Uh, but even if it's not uh, like that, um, the, the European civil procedure uh, hasn't been inquisitorial in any sense that you would recognize, at least since the early 20th century. Um, so the adversarial process is uh, the absolute norm for at least for civil, for civil um, litigation around the world. Um, in criminal, I mean, not American adversarialism, okay? We all realize, I mean, no. I'm telling you, my students, <laughs> we did that this week in my survey. Um, Dean, they don't know how, how, how much of an outlier the United States is. Yeah, I've got to work on that. Um, so um, in, in the, Amer the American adversarialism is, 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 is a wild outlier. Um, but like if you take the UK version of adversarialism, that's the norm. You find the same you know, roughly in, in France or the Netherlands or, or, or Germany. A criminal procedure is a little bit uh, more varied. Um, uh, again, if you look at um, you know, continental Europe, you wouldn't perceive that big of a difference. There's, um, but if you look at, but if you look at, uh, I don't know, that, there was a movie about Mexican criminal procedure a couple of years ago. When I when I saw it, I thought, wow, maybe this is what people mean when they talk about the the civil law cliche in, in criminal law cases. But I can tell you, that's like just very far from what's happening. It has been happening in Europe for a very very long time. Um, so that's just to say that I'm not, again, the point, right? I'm not denying that there are lots of differences between systems around the world. It's just that they don't line up with this um, civil common law division. So, so I think we have time for one more question. And then, Professor Spalman, we have a gift for you. You will not guess what it is. It's on this <laughs> graph here. And then we will all go out to Terrace to have some food and beverages and continue this celebration. So one last question. Okay. As someone who has um, studied both under a civil law and now under a common law system, I'm just wondering, um, as you know, a lot of your research shows, it seems that judges do, um, to some extent, something pretty similar. So how is it that uh, law schools teach in a very different way, and how does it end up converging in this to the same thing? That's a very, very good question. Um, so again, first thing to say about that is that U.S. law school is a complete outlier. Uh, until, until recently, the United States was the only place where law school, well, law school was a graduate education. Now we've got some experiments with this in like Korea and Japan. Um, and so that already is a big, big, big difference from the United States. But then, let's say, let's take England. Uh, yes, you have something like a case law method. Not really. I mean, they actually have lectures in the way that we do not. They actually have treatises in the way that we here do not. And yes, they have cases, but then again, so do the French. You know, like in French, when I, even when I was a student, this is now, this was three years ago, um, they, I know there is a compendia of cases that I established part of the legal education, and you actually spend a lot of time discussing those cases uh, in, in uh, at a French legal, legal university. Um, and so therefore, I don't expect that to make such a difference. But let me just say one more thing about France, because it's the kind of difference that has nothing to do with the common law civil law division, but actually, I think, profound implications for how French uh, lawyers think. French lawyers are the leftovers. They're the people who didn't make it into the elite institutions. If you're an elite Fra French, 
you go to the Grands Écoles. Those are all engineering schools. Uh, and then there's one, the, the ENS, which is a more broader school, but not law. So anybody who becomes a lawyer in France is actually somebody who didn't make it. For the longest time, I thought that my classmate in the LLM uh, was an exception, that for some weird family reason, he had chosen to become a lawyer until he then confessed to me at some point that he actually he tried to take the entrance exam to the Grands Ecole and he didn't make it, okay? <laughs> so you get, uh, you, know, you get a very different selection of people. Like here, we train the elite. But the equivalent of training the elite here is not, can't be a French law faculty in the university because they don't train the elite. The elite studies uh, somewhere else. Uh, and that, you know, different kinds of people, different um, self-image. Um, yeah, that, that's very French. Well, Netherlands, not like that, okay? You, know, you can go from country to country and you can look at uh, how the selection works and what they do there and it uh, just differs from country to country. All right, Professor Schwamann, it is now the moment you've been waiting for. Yes. Please come approach the, the secret gift and please unveil what is underneath. Yes, right there. That is for you. There it is, ah. your chair.